We cover all kinds of crazy crimes and murder, and today is no exception. I'm covering the death of Tina Watson. Tina Watson was a 26-year-old woman who died in a scuba diving accident while on a honeymoon with her husband. Notice how I did little quotes around accident? Well, that's because it was no accident, folks. Christina May Watson, who went by Tina, was born with a health condition called PSVT, which stands for Paroxysmal Supraventricular Tachycardia. This messes with your heart and can cause palpitations, causing chest pain and shortness of breath. Tina would take medication for this problem, but it never seemed to help much. David Gabriel Watson, who went by Gabe, was born in 1977. Gabe and Tina went to the same school, and once he saw her, he was hooked. He asked her a couple of times if she would be his girlfriend, but she declined. Eventually, Gabe gave it one more shot. In 2001, Gabe and Tina officially started dating while attending the University of Alabama in Birmingham. After graduating, Tina started work as a manager for a clothing store and Gabe as a bubble wrap salesman at his father's packaging company. What a title. Now, Gabe had a fascinating hobby. This was scuba diving. He loved to do it more than pretty much anything in the world. He claimed to be a certified rescue diver and was rather experienced in the world of scuba diving. He had tried to get Tina to come along on these dives. This worried Tina's parents because, well, hello, she had a severe health condition, one that restricted breathing and seriously messed with her chest and heart. Tina's parents were very frank about their fears with Gabe, but he never took them seriously. Tina's father was put off by this and thought that it was controlling of Gabe to demand this from her. Regardless, Tina took the lessons. In 2003, Gabe approached Tina's father to ask for his blessing. Tina's parents felt that Gabe did whatever he wanted to do, despite the thoughts and opinions of others. Tommy did not outright give his permission, and Gabe completely disregarded the rejection. He proposed, and she said yes. My thing is, why ask for the dad's permission if you're just gonna disregard it? About five months after their engagement, Tina went to her father and asked for her life insurance policy to be upped. On top of that, she wanted Gabe to be the beneficiary, sole beneficiary, might I add. This was obviously strange to Tommy and felt way too rushed. He said they would discuss it once the couple returned from their honeymoon. The following month in October, Tina and Gabe were officially married. The day after their wedding, the two boarded a plane for Australia to go on their honeymoon for two weeks. They planned a scuba diving excursion on the Great Barrier Reef to check out an old shipwreck. The SS Yungala was a cargo and passenger ship that sank in 1911. While this does sound very cool, that particular diving trip was super challenging. Usually only the most experienced divers can go on the dive. To make matters worse, Gabe had practically no open ocean diving experience, and Tina had never dived in the ocean before, period. She had never made it past nine meters. For dives like these, a professional diver is offered to help and ensure everything goes smoothly. Well, Gabe did not like that and refused for anyone else to go with them. Before the two started the dive, Gabe had some issues with his equipment, specifically his diving computer. This computer is essential because it tells divers how long they have been underwater and how deep they have gone. Also, it signals to them when they need to come back up to the surface. Super important stuff. When Tina saw that Gabe was having difficulties with his tech, she started to panic a little bit. I completely understand the worry. I mean, you're out in the middle of the water and about to throw yourself into the endless depth of the ocean and your equipment freezes up? Yeah, count me out, thanks. Before they started, Gabe asked for additional weights to be added to Tina's vest. Gabe stated that Tina could not descend without it, so an additional 12 pounds were added to her vest. After this, she was carrying 20 pounds altogether. The couple went into the water, and without a couple of minutes, things were already starting to go wrong. Gabe said that he looked around and could not find Tina anywhere. Then he looked and saw her sinking rapidly 98 meters below the surface. Now, certified rescue diver Gabe Watson did exactly what anyone would do in that situation and popped back up to the surface. 
That's right. Instead of swimming down into the ocean to save your wife, who you married less than six minutes ago, Gabe swam back up to the boat. Another diver who was with them, the trip director, saw that Tina was sinking and rapidly came to her rescue. He grabbed her body and pulled her onto another nearby boat called the Jazz 2. For the next half an hour, the diving instructor tried giving her CPR. Gabe never asked for the main boat to bring him to Jazz 2 as they try to save Tina's life. The emergency team showed up and Tina was quickly rushed to the hospital. The doctors started to scope out the problems when they noticed that there was little to no water in her lungs. Sadly, Tina could not be saved and died that same day. The diving director noted how weird the entire situation seemed. For one, there is a natural buoyancy to the body and the rate at which Tina sank was concerning. When he retrieved her, he had to remove the 20 pound weights attached to her, when in reality, she only needed about eight pounds. The other people on the boat noticed how bizarre Gabe's reaction to the incident was. While his brand new wife was getting CPR from drowning, he walked around the ship and asked everyone for hugs. He did not seem phased by the situation at all. So Tina and Gabe were not the only people on this dive. Multiple others were also going on the excursion and they witnessed some eyebrow raising things under the water. Tina was seen flailing her arms and legs. As she did this, Gabe swam up to her and gave her a massive bear hug. Once he let go, that's when Tina started to sink further down. Another diver took photos of the dive, and Tina was discovered in one of these photos weeks after they had been developed. It showed Tina lying face up on the ocean floor. It is very eerie. Gabe was questioned because no one could wrap their heads around how this could have happened. Gabe changed up his story multiple times. When he was asked, well, why didn't you want to go to your wife? He claimed he could not bear to see someone working on his wife while she was in that condition. After Tina was pronounced lifeless, Gabe contacted his family to tell them the horrible news. While on the phone, he asked if they could call and tell Tina's parents the information. Why was he so against talking to them? If it genuinely was an accident, why couldn't he bring himself to do it? Everything was so weird and not looking good for Gabe. The days after Tina's death, Gabe flew back to the United States. The family started making funeral arrangements and Tina's father knew that something was wrong. First, Gabe practically hid the information about Tina's death from them. Second, Gabe behaved like a frat boy at the funeral, commenting on Tina's body in the casket in front of friends and family. Here's where things get particularly interesting in my opinion. A short amount of time after the funeral, Gabe was after that money. You know, the life insurance policy? He was hungry for it. The insurance company told Gabe that drowning while scuba diving was not covered. Also, he was not entitled to any of her money. Why? Because Tommy, Tina's dad, never put Gabe's name on the documents. Tommy knew that Gabe was rotten and none of his questions were getting answers. So he decided to fly out to Australia to discuss details with the diving company and the Townsville Police Department. While there, the police agreed that the entire situation was fishy. The state coroner's office opened an investigation on the incident based on Gabe's conflicting statements and the implausibility of the situation. Prosecutors noted that Gabe's ever-changing story never seemed to match up with the recorded actions from his diving computer. The computer tracks your movements and when they happen, which they used to narrow down what had actually happened to Tina. They narrowed it down to this. Gabe asked for more weight to be added to Tina's belt and vest. Then, while they were underwater, Gabe went to give her a bear hug, and as he did, he turned off Tina's regulator. He waited until she was unconscious, turned the air regulator back on, and waited for her to sink. In March 2005, Gabe took legal action to recoup the cost of the trip after the insurance company refused a payout. Gabe wanted $45,000 for the accidental death, plus compensation for the trip getting interrupted, medical expenses, phone calls, taxi fare, and mental and emotional anguish. 
This guy was squeezing these people's pockets dry. Three years later, Gabe requested that this action be dismissed. Here's what makes exactly zero sense to me. Tina's body was brought back to America to be buried. People would come to her grave to pay their respects and leave flowers and other gifts on her gravestone. However, Tina's father noticed that the flowers and arrangements were ripped up and trashed each time he went to visit her grave. Who could have been doing this? Well, police found surveillance footage of none other than Gabe Watson coming to her grave, ripping up the flowers and gifts, and throwing them into the trash cans. For years, Gabe refused to return to Australia so the legal process could play out. Finally, in May of 2009, he hopped his butt on a plane to stand trial in Australia. Prosecutors brought up the fact that Gabe changed his story over 16 times, and none of these stories matched up with witnesses. On top of that, Gabe was supposedly an experienced rescue diver and did nothing to save Tina. On June 5, 2009, Gabe Watson was sentenced to four and a half years in prison for committing manslaughter. The defense team filed for an appeal, saying that Gabe just had a little momentary lapse in his judgment and had been accused of a crime he simply did not commit. However, the Alabama court system wanted to take Gabe to trial in the U.S., and they did just that. Gabe was indicted on two counts, one of capital murder and the other of kidnapping and trickery. Because apparently, Gabe had been planning this for months. Supposedly, before Gabe and Tina got engaged, the two had broken up. Then, Tina started to date someone else, which enraged Gabe to the point where he began harassing Tina. Eventually, the two got back together when he convinced her to take scuba diving lessons. This, and the fact that he wanted to be the sole beneficiary for her life insurance policy, seems like a pretty apparent motive to me. Gabe was removed as the administrator of Tina's estate, and it was granted to Tommy instead. But get this, the potential motive, witness testimony to Gabe's weird behavior, and life insurance situation were not allowed to be presented in court. The judge found insufficient evidence to convict Gabe of murder, and Gabe was let go of all charges, and Tina's family had no closure. Do you all think this was a fair resolution? I don't think so, and I think everything is a little too suspicious. I would love to hear what you all think in the comment section. I'm sure you have some grand theories. I'm Brandy. Thank you so much for watching Killer Bites. See you next time.